Welcome back to part two of our conversation with designated drinker David J. Silverman, professor of history at George Washington University and author of This Land is Their Land, The Wampanoag Indians, Plymouth Colony, and The Troubled History of Thanksgiving. Um, so if you've missed part one, go ahead and belly back up to that bar and give it a listen first. Um, we promise we're going to save you a seat right here, so don't worry. So in part one, we talked about the first Thanksgiving a little bit and what that menu might look like. And... Um, touched a little bit about how you fell in love with history and what it, how it led you into uh, becoming that expert in Native American experience, past and present. Um, so now I'd really love to take a deep dive into your book, really kind of get, get down into it. Um, and to set the stage, uh, Gina, I think I want to read the first paragraph out of his book. What do you think? All right. You should have made a cocktail to go with that, right? You want to do that first? Yes. All right. Well, let's. Why not? We we've been off format this entire time, so we might as well just keep it going. Let's get him a cocktail first. Um, I just rewound the cassette tape, and it, it's true. We did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go make that cocktail. All right. So I definitely love you know all things that are mezcal, and I love my um, apple and raisin syrup. I've been you know making this for a long time, so. You know, a little birdie told us that obviously that David loves mezcal or bourbon. I figured what's better than putting, you know, an agave syrup right onto our being thankful for our friends and family um, in this time of this season. So the drink is called the Raisin in the Sun. And we're going to do two ounces of mezcal. Now, mezcal is personal. You like super smoky mezcal? That's amazing. Go get it. You like really expensive mezcal? Awesome. You want an affordable mezcal, the Illegal Hoven is both smoky and affordable and delicious and very easily and easily found. So go on your path of mezcal, do what you need to do, but you could do the Hoven with this and it'd be just equally delicious. Okay, so it's two ounces of uh, mezcal and then we're gonna do one ounce of our apple and raisin syrup. And if you could see it, it's got this really, let me see if you can see it. It's got this beautiful color, which I love. Um, we're going to put that in. Uh, and then we have one ounce of fresh lime juice. And if any of you guys are thinking this recipe sounds a little familiar, you know, it's kind of based in the world of the daiquiri. Meets a pisco sourish in the build, but not quite. So we're going to add our citrus to that. We have in there our <clears throat> sugar. And now we're going to add two dashes of Angostura bitters. One, two, and now this is when you make it personal. Do you want something that's more flippy and foamy and has a little bit more body? You add an egg white. You want to keep it, you know, nice and loose? You do nothing but shake this drink. Either way, it's both delicious. I am going to add an egg white and I'm going to do my little, um, the way you build that. We built the cocktail in the large started steaker. There is no ice in here yet. You break your egg to get your egg white in the small part of the shaker because if you get the yolk in there or the egg is bad, you didn't just ruin your entire drink. So we'll do that in the small part of our shaker, tin. Oh, and what was that, Louise? Yes, those are my farm eggs that I raised the chickens. <laughs> oh, we haven't talked about the chicks today. <laughs> and know everything about those eggs. All right, so we're going to do what they call a dry shake. No ice. Shake it up. Keep both hands on your shaker tin because it is going to pop off. You're creating pressure. When you tap it, it pops up, and you look inside, and you're like, oh, is it foamy? It's foamy. Oh, it is. It no ice. So now we're going to add ice, and we're going to be a chilled cocktail glass, and I'm going to put the top back on. I'm going to shake it again. Nice and frosty on the outside. Frosty and frothy. That's what we're looking for. Right? Well, I skip. I'm not doing the egg today. No egg, but frosty. And it should be a little frothy still. Someday you're going to teach me how to get this off right, Gina. It is. You it is foamy. wish for it and it comes off. <laughs> and then you have this really beautiful, I, I don't even know how to describe the color. I feel like it's neutral. I don't even know. What, it is. It's a beautiful color, though. Pretty, though. Gina. Yes. Since I did mine without um, egg, do you think an apple slice would be a nice garnishment? What would you garnish with since uh, I did without egg? Let me see you yours. I think nothing. I feel nothing. Because I did it on ice with no no garnishment? It doesn't, I don't think it needs anything. Okay, then. You put an apple slice across the top. I'm throwing it out. 
I don't, sometimes they just don't need garnishes, you know? Okay, all right. Gina, what else would you mix that with? Would you only use a, a mezcal or, or bourbon with that? Uh, something with some body. I have a lot of body. You need something to stand up to. The, remember you made the syrup with beer, so you need something I to like, get in there. So what do you think of that drink, David? I think it's terrific. Good. Yeah, Good. it's gonna be an interesting drive home. <laughs> <laughs> so where are they gonna go to get that recipe, Gina? You're gonna go to Designated Drinker Not Show for the recipes and tips and tricks and how-tos. And follow us on Instagram at Designated Drinker. And you can ask us questions, communicate, hit us up for a DM. We'd love to see you there. And definitely gonna get a link to, um, to David's book. And find out all the real things about Thanksgiving. So speaking of, we're gonna the first paragraph. Serious critical history tends to be hard on the living. It challenges us to see distortions embedded in the heroic national origin myths we've been taught since childhood. It takes enemies, demonized by previous generations, and treats them as worthy of understanding in their particular contexts. Ideological absolutes, civility and savagery, liberty and tyranny, and especially us and them, begin to blur. People from our own society who are not supposed to matter, and whose historical experiences show how the injustices of the past have shaped the injustices of the present, move from the shadows into the light. Because critical history challenges assumptions and authority, it often leaves us feeling uncomfortable. Yet it also has the capacity to help us become more humble and humane. I think it's so, if, if nothing else, if you only read that, I don't know how you would not. I mean, I, honestly, when I got, I read that the other day when um, I got the PDF of your book, and all I wanted to do was read the rest. And unfortunately, I didn't have time. <laughs> But I can't wait to, I really, honestly, it's just the way you opened it up. It just pulls you in. And I read, I wanted to read the second paragraph. I read like the first like chapter, first part of the chapter. And I was like, I just, I, I would read, have you read the entire book? Actually, you should read your own audio book. That was great. Um, I, I just, your word, the way you just put it together and, and quickly made the reader immediately realize why it's important to think about this, why it's important to even discuss these things. That it is, I say this a lot, that when we start learning about more and more about each other, the others, um, we realize we're so much more alike. There's so many things It just, you break down barriers as my point and open up people's eyes. We realize we are all people and that we all you know, put our pants on one leg at a time and we have terrible history and injustices, but it allows us to try to see past that and to your point, the they and them, the us and them kind of thing. Um, right. So I thank mean, you. Know, you. The, the Thanksgiving myth tries to condition people with, from any one of a variety of backgrounds, including backgrounds like mine. You know, my last name's Silverman. Clearly I'm not descended from the pilgrim. <laughs> Uh, but it, it tries to get a wide variety of, especially white Americans, to view the pilgrims as we. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by implication, it makes Native people them. Yeah. And yet, most Americans don't descend from either group. <laughs> and the descendants of both groups are all our fellow Americans. So, you know, why privilege one group as us or we and, the, and denigrate the other one as them? and not worthy of understanding. Well, it's easier to step on someone to get higher, is it not? Yeah, well, well, well for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, I, you know, I think the great challenge um, in terms of American culture and politics and of, of history writing is to include everybody who's part of the story. Yeah. I think it's very interesting when um, it's somebody else's history, like black history. I don't, Yes, the experience is singular and is yours alone, but history isn't in a silo. Your history doesn't happen without an effect or effect on anyone else around you. That's why it's very, or like women's history. Well, the last time I checked, there were, there were men in that story too. You know what I mean? That's my thing is your, right. your experience, those experiences which become our history is a shared space. That's exactly right. Because the other thing is, is in the uh, the other side of this, if you continue to say, well, this is their history, then it means you had nothing to do with it, therefore you don't need to own up to it or 
try to understand that there needs to be a mend in some spaces. I think that's the other thing, is if we make it theirs and not ours, then I had nothing to do with it. Well, that's precisely right. And, you know, the deconstructing the Thanksgiving myth and bringing the story of the Wampanoag people and indigenous people more generally um, to the fore, it reveals how profoundly American society has been shaped by Native American experiences and the encounter between Europeans and indigenous people. Our identities, our power structures, uh, you know, look, uh, the very land that we're sitting on was indigenous land. Yes. Right? So uh, you start with that very principle. Well, obviously these, are, these people are important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because why, <laughs> why would one person's ancestry matter when if the other one doesn't? Like, because did it only start when when the, it didn't just start when the pilgrims got here. No, that's what I'm no, saying. No, not at all. America, America is an ancient place. Yeah. And, it, you know, the, viewing United States history through the, the eyes of indigenous people opens up a whole set of issues and themes that most Americans are not taught to think about, but that are profoundly important uh, for having a critical view of our society. Well, it was interesting when we were talking the other day is when we were talking about the fact that if um, th I wanted to ask you to bring that back up is about why do you think the Wampanoags like joined or, or became allies or looked yeah. for allies in, in the European um See, that part of the Thanksgiving myth is true. They did become yeah. friends for a very brief period of time with, with the English. But what the Thanksgiving myth does is it, it robs that alliance of all its context. Yeah. It makes it seem like they're just innately friendly yeah. people. That is not the case. <laughs> That's not what's happening. You know, so you know, there, there are a couple of issues at play in their reaching out to the English. One is that they had just suffered a terrible epidemic disease introduced by some European explorer. Sure. Um, so between 1616 and 1619, this disease, we don't know its identity. It might have been smallpox. People said it was a plague. Th yeah. That doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean that, just yeah. means a disease. But it wiped out the majority of their population. And so as soon as that disease ends, their enemies to the West, the Narragansett people, start attempting to subjugate them. So then the English arrive. Yeah. And what they see are these people who have guns and swords and other metal goods. They've had contacts with, the, with Europeans for the better part of 100 years. So they know that they're powerful and treacherous. Yes. They think, well, if we harness these folks to us, then maybe we can preserve our independence against the Narragansetts. And it actually works. They do preserve their independence. Now, they don't know what's coming down the pike. They don't know that within got, 30 years, they're going, to rec they're going to see the English as a much bigger threat than yeah. the Narragansetts ever had been. But that, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Of course, of course. It was interesting when you also told me is that um, we see it as like singular, but they, you, you told me that they had actually gone to England. Well, there are some Wampanoags who had been to England. So... Although though the Thanksgiving myth suggests that the arrival of the Mayflower is a first contact ep episode, it's not a first contact episode. The, the first recorded contact between the Wampanoags and Europeans is 1524. Not 16, 15. That's wow. when Giovanni de Verrazzano is, ex is exploring what's now New England. Um, and there are intermittent contacts for the next century. Um, and yeah. they start to pick up steam in the years... Uh, preceding the Mayflower's arrival. These contacts did not go well, by and large, and uh, they often involve kidnapping. Uh, Europeans kidnapping Native people and then transporting them across the ocean, either for sale into slavery wow. um, or for training as interpreters and guides for future voyages. Now, many Wampanoags suffer this fate. Um, in one particularly, uh, particularly egregious episode, um, an English captain seizes two dozen Wampanoags. Well, a couple of Wampanoags in, in these kidnapping cases managed to make it back after years of living in London. Wow. And so, you know, they know English society, they've learned the English language, they've figured out what makes these people tick. And two, one of them is well known from the Thanksgiving story. His name is Squanto or Tisquantum. Um, he was fluent in English. He actually knew the sponsors of the Mayflower Voyage. Um, and is in, in this really, a, a really great position to mediate between English and Wampanoag society. 
So, they, you know, these aren't naive primitives yes. awestruck at the arrival of the Mayflower passengers. Yeah. yeah, that's really what I was hoping to get to, is that it when we were talking about that, it, again, it made, it makes them, it makes what we have felt, as, as, you know, Native Americans, what we know feels very flat, one-sided. Um, you don't see the roundness or the whole side of a, of a culture or a society to think that like, just the, the fact that they thought they could outdo the other with getting um, in bed with the British and ended up putting their own, putting themselves in danger, obviously in the long, in the long haul. But there was, there was critical thinking there. There was like, okay, if we do this, X will happen. But we see them as, to your point, these very simple people that were easily overcome. And, you know, one was more powerful than the other. And I mean, obviously that happened, but I mean, we don't see them when I'm trying, my, I'm stumbling over my words today, but it's, they're two dimensional people. That's right. That's exactly right. One of the great challenges of teaching and writing about Native American history is you, you begin with the premise, there are no Indians yeah. when this story started. The, uh, Europeans view them that way, but Native people didn't view themselves as having anything in common with each other. Yeah. Right? They're, yeah. they're a continent full of diverse people yeah. with, with competing interests. Yeah. And so intertribal rivalries very often are the drivers of Native American behavior in ways that are fascinating to unpack. I mean, really, I, I like in colonial America to Game of Thrones. I mean, it really is. I, all these factions jousting, jousting for advantage and often in a very ruthless fashion. So did they have dragons too? Uh, I, I, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. And they had dogs. Uh, you know, they could be ferocious. Yeah. <laughs> they, maybe dire wolves, maybe. <laughs> Oh, too good. You had to end it with the fun. You gotta get, you know, bring some fun back into it. That's awesome. But again, just make sure that our listeners understand you are not advocating for the for not celebrating Thanksgiving, but really understanding what it means. Right, right. No question about it. So let, let me emphasize here: white New Englanders celebrated Thanksgiving throughout the 17th, the 18th, and the early 19th century without ever invoking pilgrims and Indians. Ever. Yeah. That's a 19th century invention to answer 19th century anxieties and desires. So for most of the American history of the celebrating of Thanksgiving, the holiday has not been attached to the story of Plymouth Colony and the Wampanoags. So if you want to celebrate a traditional Thanksgiving, don't invoke pilgrims and Indians. Yeah, yeah. It's possible to do that. <laughs> well, it's probably true to most people. I mean, like what you do with Thanksgiving, but just it is also understanding where um, some of our traditions come from. Again, what you're taught as a child and how to, to correct some of those wrongs. Right. So, so if you are invoking this feel-good false history, right, of, of pilgrims and Indians, you're, you're doing two things. Well, yeah, one is it's bad history. Now, the, uh, that offends me as a historian probably <laughs> more than most of your audience members. Um, but the other thing I think people need to, to keep in mind is you, it's doing damage to indigenous people. Yeah. It hurts them. And no segment of American society should be hurt by a national holiday. That's not what national holidays are about. They're, they're about bringing us together. True. Sure. This does not bring us together. Under those con under that context. It makes Native people feel like second-class citizens. Yeah. And there's a lot in American society that makes them feel like second-class citizens. Yes. I would just suggest this is a painless way to make a little progress. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. That's a great way. Painless way. I like that. All right, Gina. <clears throat> yeah. It's you. Okay, so you have one last question, and we're going to do a little switch-up. So, you know, a lot of people will uh, come up with a spirited um, something to identify themselves with, right? And, and it could be anything from, like, the way the sun or you know, the moon, the stars, whatever. If you could have one spirit ingredient to identify you, what would that ingredient be? And it could be for cooking or for cocktails. Wow. Well, you, you nailed it for the cocktail. I mean, the mezcal is great. I, I could go with that. I could also go with a, a single malt scotch. For cooking, I, I, I think I'm going with hot peppers of one sort or another. I'll go with jalapenos. Oh, that's hilarious. Why, Why jalapenos? Well, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's simple as that. I like hot spicy food. 
a little earthy, a little spicy. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I like that answer a lot. Awesome. Also, scotch and jalapenos, I feel like you're on to something for like a good barbecue rub. Ooh. I don't know. Yeah. Wow. All right, Louise. Well, then, until next time. Maybe we do that, that scotch rub on our uh, turkey. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Instead of, instead of a bourbon brine. Exactly. Maybe. It was nice meeting you, David. Yeah, yes, likewise. I just want you to both know I'm so thankful for both of you. Thank you for bringing all your knowledge to the table. Gina, thank you for bringing all your talents and these beautiful cocktails and your lovely just self being here with us. All right. Thank you. And uh, happy holidays. I'm thankful for you. Happy holidays. The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company that is dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcasts is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia, led by skilled caregivers Bobby and Mike Carducci. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Link's League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, and review the shows. Your review helps our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company. 